so thankful that Jesus paid it all and that he looks after us. And he was certainly here on the campground this week. Uh, uh, poor Debbie took a bad fall on Tuesday as she was helping to uh, do a food order and unload a truck. But we're thankful for God's protective hand upon her and upon her being today. It's also good to have some uh, new friends with us today, the McWilliams, they're back, and it's good to have them with us worshiping uh, this morning. If you'd like to open your Bibles to the book of Joshua, uh, Joshua chapter 3, we looked at chapter 1 last week, and I think I'm going to just kind of preach a series through this Old Testament book. Um, I'm skipping chapter 2, just I, I had used that chapter in a recent sermon, and <clears throat> it was recent enough, I just wanted to go ahead and go to chapter 3. But in Joshua, there's lots that we can learn from. There's some leadership principles in the book of Joshua that I think we could pick up on. There's some spiritual formation issues there in this Old Testament book. And, and I think as we study this book, it'll, it'll prepare us as a church for the future that God has provided for us. And uh, it's a pivotal time in the book, in the history of Israel and uh, lots there to chew on. You know, the Word of God is rich, <clears throat> and, and it's got a lot of meat to it. It's got a lot of treasure in it. And if you are willing to kind of mine the Word of God, there's a lot there that we could learn. And so through this series, there's probably going to feel like there are times where this feels like more of a Bible study uh, than a sermon. But uh, just keep in mind, we're slowing down. We're going slow so that we can enjoy what it says and really mine out some good nuggets that are here for us today. Lord Jesus, before the word is ever read, we pray that you prepare our hearts and our minds for what's ahead. May we be receptive, Lord, to your word today. Uh, like I said, your word is truth, and it's full of uh, richness, Lord. Help us to not miss what you would have for us today, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to look at the first six verses today, and if we have time, we'll go a little further. But we're going to take our time as we go through this book today. In chapter 3, uh, we're going to look at the last orders that Joshua gave the people as they prepared to cross the Jordan. And picking up in verse 1, it says, Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out for Shittim, and went over to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests who are Levites carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you've never been this way before. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, Take up the ark of the covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. Can you imagine that morning? I bet Joshua hadn't slept a wink all night the night before. Because he knew that, that tomorrow was going to be the day when God's promises were going to become reality. I bet he didn't sleep. I bet he had leadership things on his mind. I bet he had organizational thoughts on his mind. I, he was probably trying to order his words. What should I say to the people before we cross over? What do they need to hear? Uh, what needs to be communicated? I can just imagine him getting up early. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, but I can imagine him getting up early and walking through the encampment. And there's the smell of smoke in the air from the, from the different uh, little fire pits that each tent had and People were probably just getting up and just starting to stir. And there was probably just kind of the calm before the storm. 
And I imagine as he walked through that camp, he probably walked through that camp that morning in a way that he had never walked through before because great things were about to happen. Life for Israel was about to change. And can you imagine with me just for a, a moment the enormity of what God has asked and called Joshua to do? Uh, last week in chapter 1, uh, Israel was reminded that Moses is dead. Moses was dead. And his shadow loomed large over Israel. They even gave Moses a 30-day mourning period, according to the book of Deuteronomy. But God got a hold of young Joshua, and he, he said to Joshua, Just as I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. Isn't that great about how God does that? When he calls us to a, an enormous task, he does not leave us to try to figure things out by himself, but he says to Joshua, we're going to do this together. Just as I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. And he told Joshua, now is the time to take these promises and help turn them into reality. He told Joshua to be strong and courageous. And he would need to be that. Because he would be second guessed. He would face the reality of change. He would face the reality of fear. And now was not the time to be timid or conservative. But to be bold, strong, and courageous. He also reminded Joshua and the people... Do not let the law of Moses depart from your mouth or your mind. Speak the, the law of Moses and meditate on it day and night. That was so important because that was the key, really, to being bold and courageous. So we, we come to chapter 3, and the advance is so close, Joshua could probably almost taste it. And um, I imagine in some ways for, for Joshua... And the people, they, they were ready to go. And I want to share with you, based on verses 1 through 3, we're going to go slow, and we're going to look at a portion of Scripture. Right now, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3. So I hope you haven't closed your Bibles just yet. <clears throat> and I want to pull out some indicators that demonstrated that the people were ready to move on. And these are indicators, I think, of, of faith. And faith is trust. Faith is trusting in the promises of God, the leadership of God, and the character of God. But here are some indicators that the, not only was Joshua ready, but the people were ready. And, and this is significant because we're not talking about 40 or 50 people. We're talking about a conservative estimate of maybe between 1 million people and 3 million people. Have you ever tried to, on a Sunday after church, try to get five people to decide where to eat lunch? And everybody to be in agreement about where to go and what should be done? Anybody ever be in that predicament? Come on, be honest. Imagine how it is for Joshua. Three million people. And everybody's got to be on the same page. Everybody's got to be listening. Everybody's got to be obeying. And they all have needs. If they cross the Jordan, they got to have food to eat. Three million people have to go to the bathroom somewhere. Three million people entering a desert-type area. They've got to have water from somewhere. They've got to have provisions for the journey from somewhere. And you know that it, among three million people, at least one guy has a differing opinion. Thank you, Pastor. At least one does. And so heavy is the head that wears the crown. He remembered the days of Moses when people murmured and complained. But here are some indicators that the people, all three million, between a million and three million people, that they were ready. Number one, there were signs of involvement and cooperation from his lieutenants. There's no way that Joshua by himself 
unless God miraculously intervened. There's no way that he could have communicated individually to three million people. And so his lieutenants went through the camp and spoke to the people and told them what was to happen. And so there was cooperation that way. Another little indicator of faith that the people were ready is that they were ready to march on short notice. And, and there's a lot of bunny trails here today um, that, that I could follow. And this is, this is kind of one of them, and I'll be quick and to the point. But as the people of God, even today, we need to be prepared to march on short notice. Do you know why? Because Jesus could return at any moment. And so like the ancient Israelites of Joshua chapter 3, we need to be prepared to, to be able to march at any moment. One of Joshua's tasks was to get the people ready. One of my tasks as your pastor is to help get you ready. And you need to know that this could happen at any time. We need to be able to march at a moment's notice. There was another indicator of faith is that by now the people were ready. They were ready to move to the east side of the Jordan. And at least at this point in chapter 3, they were willing to pay the price. God had promised the promised land through this covenant relationship. And he had promised that. In God's mind, it was a done deal. But the Israelites had to be willing to go. They had to be willing to fight for what God had promised. Because the promised land was filled with all kinds of different cultures who did not know God, nor did they desire to follow Yahweh. And God did not want Israel to cross the river, get into the promised land, and then be more influenced by these pagan cultures than their own spiritual culture. So they were ready to go. Another indicator was they were, they were determined to pay the price. The last indicator is this is that God's work always advances when he has those who believe in him and are willing to act like it. I'm going to read that again. God's work always advances when he has those who believe in him and are willing to act like it. I want to remind you about these three million people real quick. They are the descendants of slaves. They are not professional soldiers. They are the, the first generation removed from, from Egypt, and they were slaves in Egypt. And many of that first generation died in the wilderness wanderings. And so these weren't professional soldiers. These weren't professional explorers. This wasn't uh, Jacques Cousteau here leading them into some new uncharted era. They were normal, average people just like you and I. They had survived the desert wanderings because God provided them manna and quail and and a, and a pillar of fire and a cloud by day, all of those things. But they were really normal, ordinary people. And I want to tell you a secret. Sometimes we elevate these people in Scripture to almost a superhuman status, but they were just ordinary people depending on an extraordinary God. And I want you to know that in today's time, today might be 2022. But that condition has not changed. We're just plain, ordinary people today, aren't we? But we are clinging to a living hope in an extraordinary God. The only God. The true and living God. And only God could bring these three billion people together for such a task as this. It's hard to get people on the same page. It's like wrangling cats sometimes. I pulled up here, and I've got permission to tell this story today, but I pulled up to the camp this week, and, and, and we had like 470-something campers here this week. It was a great week, and 
I pulled in in front of the office, and I barely opened my door, and I heard one of the best greetings that I ever get when I, when I pull in at Pinecrest. It was this youthful, upbeat, positive voice, and it said, Hey, Pastor Jim! And I knew who, immediately who it was who was greeted me. He was greeting me. And I turned and Lincoln runs up to me. And he says, Pastor Jim, do you want to play rocks? And I thought, how do you play rocks? So I followed Lincoln across the street over to the office. And he had on the ground, he had a whole bunch of rocks displayed all over the ground. And he had this little little box, and he dug into his pocket and pulled out a big old wad of money. Big old wad of money. And he had been selling rocks to our Pentecostal friends who were here this week. And even a few, even a few of our Nazarenes were, were, were reeled in on that one. And he said, Pastor Jim, do you want to buy a rock? And I said, well, Lincoln, I would, but I don't have a dollar on me. Do you, do you take debit cards? He said, no, but he had done a great job selling those rocks. And I said, you've been hanging around with Noel Umfleet, haven't you? <laughs> but I thought, if, if a child, a smart child, is creative enough to get a bunch of adults to buy into the idea of buying rocks, how much more should we be buying in to the plans of God? That if a child can get an adult to buy a rock what's the bible say unless we have the faith of a child we will not see the kingdom of god Ooh, church isn't it time that if we truly believe in the promises of god we believe in his leadership and his vision for our church isn't it about time that we begin to buy in even if it costs us a little bit amen i love lincoln he's a good friend of mine but can you imagine getting three million people on the same page that if god can get three million people on the same page i think he could get 40 people i think he could get 50 people i think god could get 60 people come on i need some amens I think God gets 70 people on the same page. I think God could get 80 people on the same page. I think God could get our district on the same page. Well, let me share with you some last orders before the advance. And now we're looking at verses 3 through 7. And because I took so long with the first three, and I apologize for that, let's review three through seven and just read it together. And it says, giving orders to the people, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my place, and the priests who are Levites carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you've never been this way before. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Joshua said to the priests, Take up the ark of the covenant, pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went on ahead of them. I want to pull out some neat things here in verses 3 through 7. Uh, here and they have a lot to do with the ark of the covenant and and again joshua's command to consecrate themselves so i want to look at these two things before we run out of time today um, previously god had worked with and through moses and you know those stories and you're familiar with those stories but previously god had worked 
with and through Moses. And he had also promised to do that with Joshua. But there was, a, there was going to be from this point forward a distinct difference in how God used and led through Moses and a distinct difference between how God led through Joshua. One of the ways that God led through Moses, and I just mentioned it a while ago, was he used a pillar of cloud and a fire that guided Israel during that time. If you, in your Old Testament reading, you remember that that was just God's method. That's how God chose to give guidance and leadership to Israel through Moses. But today was a new day, and here is Joshua. And from chapter 3 on, God is doing something new. He is still shepherding the people. He's still giving them guidance. He's still giving them leadership. But from now on, instead of the fire and the cloud, what was God going to use? He was going to use the ark. He was going to use the ark of the covenant. And that's a different uh, expression of leadership that God was using. In fact, God says to Joshua, as he's instructing the people, that the ark of the covenant was to move out first. Now, I don't know about you, and I haven't studied military strategy um, a whole lot at all, but I would think if you were going into a strange land with strange people, maybe you'd put the military first. Maybe you would put some of the guys that were a little more adapt to fighting first. But God doesn't always use worldly strategy. So God has a mind of his own, friends. He does. God has a mind of his own. He has methods that are unique to him. And God said, before you go, the ark has to go first. And let's talk about the ark just, just for a moment, just so that that kind of sinks in but the ark of the covenant it represented god's presence it was a it was a visual tangible way that people could envision god's presence and it did god's presence hovered over that ark and the ark was probably like a rectangle and inside the ark were the holy things of god Inside the ark were, were the, the, the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. Inside the ark was the staff of Aaron that, that budded. You remember that story. Inside the ark were samples of the manna and the gold uh, utensils that took care of all of that. All of those holy things were inside the ark. So the ark in the eyes of God was a holy thing. It might might have been a holy thing in the way that we look at these altars here as holy things. Or the way that we look at our communion table. The communion table is is a holy thing. Or the pulpit is a holy thing. Or, Or this camp for many of us. We've expressed this camp in many ways. This camp is a holy sanctuary for us. But in the mind of God, it was a holy thing. The ark communicated God's holiness. They weren't to touch it. In fact, God says to these three million... Now, think about how hard this would have been. Everybody see the kids parade this year during family camp? Wasn't that cool? And it was interesting to watch the kids camp as they rode their bikes and some of the older kids drove their golf carts through the, through the parade. And, and there were times in, in the ebb and flow of the, of the parade and the traffic of the parade, there were little blocks, uh, spaces where there was no people because one side had bunched up over here and one side had bunched up over here. But God here is telling three million people that they've got to stay at least a thousand yards behind the ark. Anybody here know how far a thousand yards is? Okay, let me ask it another way. You're correct, but let me ask another way. In terms of miles, how far is that? Yes, sir. You get an A, Fred. I knew Fred would know. 
but it's just over half a mile. So you've got between one million people and three million people, and they're following the ark, and the ark has to go first because it, it showcases the preeminence of God. What does that fancy word mean? It means that God comes first. The preeminence of God. That God is leading these people, and we don't dare get in front of God. And we don't think too highly of ourselves that we're walking up there, right there with God. God says you're to walk a half a mile behind me. Now, this this requires some planning. This requires some pacing of the people. Between a million and three million people, we're going to stay a a little over a half a mile from the ark as it goes into into the promised land. But this ark had special purposes. It was to serve as a sign of the presence of God. It contained the holy things of God. And in the inside of the ark was the law of God. And that's exciting. That's interesting. But do you know what was on the outside of the ark? The inside contained the law. The law of Moses. But on the outside, where the angels and the seraphim were, That was considered to be the mercy seat. And it reminded Israel that that law and order and mercy come not from man, but from God. And if we're going to be changing things, if we're going to be moving in a new direction, then God better be the one that leads us. There was a time in Israel's history, and we don't have time to go into that, when the Israelites, without God's command, without God's blessing, there was a time in which the Israelites took the ark into battle, and they were devastatingly defeated, and the ark was captured. And later on, Joshua would recapture the ark, and he would leave that ark in a town called Shiloh. Shiloh means Not just the name of the camp dog, but Shiloh means the presence of God. Later on, the ark would be put in the Holy of Holies. I wonder today, thinking about the preeminence of God and God being first, is there anything in our lives today that shows the world that God comes first? Is there anything about our lifestyle that tells the world, hey, in in my life, God comes first? That tells the world, I don't step out till God steps out. I've talked to many, many people who have made terrible, 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 terrible decisions in their lives because they stepped out before God stepped out. I got married without God's blessing. I bought that new car without talking to God about it first. Or I bought that new home without praying about it first. Or I made this job transition first without inquiring about what God wanted for me in my life. And we get in situations like that, and we've all been there. We've all been in places like that. But then when we get in those places, we ask God to deliver us and to help us and to bless our mess. And sometimes God does that. Sometimes in His mercy, even when we don't deserve it, God does bless our mess. But it would save us a whole lot of grief. And it would save us a whole lot of anguish. And it would save us a whole lot of pain if we would just wait and let God step out first. You know, we used to teach our kids that men open doors for ladies or men pull seats out for women. And those aren't bad things. And maybe we need a little revival of those kinds of things from time to time. But in the same way, God is worthy of our respect. He's worthy of our honor. And in the priorities and decisions that we make, we need to stop and wait for God to step out. And if God doesn't step out, then we don't step out. Come on, 
If God doesn't step out, we don't step out. We don't make huge, big decisions about things unless we've inquired of the Lord and we've spent time with Him. But if God does step out, it's time to move. If God stops, it's time to stop. Does that make sense? When the moment arrived for Israel to leave Sinai, the ark went with them. And it played a role in the crossing of the Jordan. And it, and it played a huge role in the fall of Jericho. A battle, Pastor Tammy, that on paper they never should have won. But God doesn't look at paper. And he doesn't look at worldly methods for leading his people. But when the ark stepped out, the people stepped out. The ark was later placed at Shiloh. And it was God's intention that the ark symbolize his very presence. So that kind of gives you an idea as we go through this book. The place of the ark of the covenant. And its significance, especially in the book of Joshua. And when the people stepped out, when God stepped out, they had success. When the people stepped out without God's blessing, it was a disaster. There's another uh, verse that I want to mine out of here for us that's very, very critical um, to us. And it's a special verse to Sherry and I. <coughs> You've heard that story before, so I'm not going to retell it today. But I do want to reread verse 5 and dig into this. Uh, quite a bit with us today in verse 5 and remember please remember these are some of the last words that Israel ha is receiving before they're crossing the Jordan and Joshua says to the people consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you what a beautiful promise I would hope that that would inspire uh, some faith in the Lord, that he's prepared to do something. But, you know, before God does something, there's always a time of preparation. And faith in the preparation is just maybe even more important than when God does those marvelous things. Sometimes we're tempted to want the marvelous things before we've consecrated. Lord, save my grandchild. Lord, help me get out of this financial mess. Uh, Lord, touch our church. Touch our camp. Lord, do this, do that. And all of these requests are probably normally worthy things and worthy of the, of the Lord's attention. God cares about all of those things but we must never put our demand on God to do things if we are not willing to be completely His. God will do amazing things tomorrow, but today we've got to consecrate ourselves. What does that mean, Pastor? Because that's not a word that we hear all the time. And, and you're right, it, it's not. But we need to know what these biblical terms mean, number one, so that we, we have a, a deeper, thorough knowledge of our scriptures, but also so that we know what God's will is for us, because this would not be the last time the word consecrate or the principle of consecration would appear in scripture. In fact, it goes all the way through. It goes all the way from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And if you've grown up in the church of the Nazarene, it has a particular place in our holiness doctrine and our holiness theology uh, that culminates in Acts chapter 2. And so we see that right now, even right now, God was planning to have a holy people. God's a planner, ladies and gentlemen, and he is a long-term planner. He can see all through, God can see through every sequence of time because God transcends time. 
The Bible says that God is the Alpha and the Omega, so that God is the beginning and the end, but God can also see everything from the beginning to the end. And God saw a need one of these days that he was going to have a church. Even way back here in the year 1400, about approximate time of Joshua chapter 3, that the seed needed to be planted. So in the fullness of time, when it was time for God to pull the trigger in Acts chapter 2, that that could happen. And God today still says to the church, I want to do amazing things through you and in you and for you. They're going to happen. And they're going to happen tomorrow. But today, you must consecrate yourself. Let's look at what this means then. And we're going to take the word consecrate, and we're going to look at it first as a verb. Now, I know it's been a while since we've been through high school, but a verb is a what? A verb is an action, isn't it? So verb, so, so consecrate as a verb means this. It means to give oneself or something to be used only by God. God makes holy what is consecrated to him. Uh, in the Old Testament, they had the temple, the tabernacle, and all that, and they had utensils, and they had special furnishings that were set apart to be used only by God and only in worship. Um, sometimes we look at um, sometimes we look at our communion utensils kind of that way. If you came to my house. And you sat on my couch and I said, hey, would you like a Coke or a Pepsi or something? You would not expect me to be uh, offering you Coke and, and communion wear. You'd kind of look at me a little, well, that's, that's a Coke, okay, Jim, but it's only about that much Coke and it's really hot outside. And it would be, it would be kind of weird, wouldn't it? Because in our minds, those communion utensils have been set aside for the Lord's Supper. And so it is in the same way that God just doesn't want things or property devoted to him and strictly for his use. But God desires that your heart and my heart be devoted to him <coughs> and to be used only for him. Does that make sense? When two people stand up and they get married and they pledge their lives together, they are pledging that, that you know, my body is only for my wife and my wife's body is only for, for me, the husband. There's a sense of consecration that happens in that moment. Now let's look at consecrate as a noun. And it means the act of giving or presenting something to God. People or things may be consecrated to God, Consecration means giving oneself to God to live a holy life. God sanctifies people who trust him and consecrate themselves to him. So before they ever got the promise and before they ever got the blessing, they were saying to themselves and to the Lord, we belong to you. That when we, from this point on, we are, Israel is devoted to you. We are your nation. We are your people and that was incredibly important because they were going into a wicked land. It was the promised land, but it was full of all kinds of other tribes and clans and nations and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Stalactites and all that stuff. And they needed to know who they were and who they belonged to and who they had made their vow to that they, they weren't going to live like the rest of the nations of the world, but they were going to live as a people given unto God. And today it, it is still true that consecration and heart holiness, th these things go hand in hand. They're inseparable. None of us can hope to be holy without first consecrating ourselves to God. And let's look at, um, do I have time? I do. I have a little bit of time. Let's look at some quick reasons for that. Now remember, this is a series. This is a series, so there'll be some things each week that'll overlap. We'll just pick up next week where we left off. But God will work his wonder. Remember, God said, tomorrow I'll do amazing things. But today you've got to consecrate yourself. God will work this wonder only in the life of a person 
with whom he has complete control. God will do amazing things to the person who has given God complete control. Not some control. Not partial control. Not 90% control. But if God is going to entrust you with His Holy Spirit, God has to have it all. He's got to have every little window every little closet every little people used to say nook and cranny i'm not sure what a nook and cranny is but god has to have all of that to do what he said he would do and i wonder how many times we miss amazing things because we haven't given god complete control any lack of consecration puts a limitation on what God can do. And he can only lead someone in the fullness of this blessing in which there's a complete disposition to obey him. And again, I said this last week, there's no such thing as partial obedience with God. To God, that's the same thing as disobedience. You know, if we take a test... We go into Miss Laney's class at school and we take a test and we get a 98%. We might think that's pretty good. And that, that is pretty good. 98%. That I would have in school taken a 98%. But do you think God's going to settle for 98%? More importantly, should he have to? Should he have to settle for 98%? No. No. But consecration reaches its climax in the surrender of our wills. And this is where things get hard. This is where things get sticky. Because within each and every one of us, there's this concept called, the old Nazarenes used to call it the old man. And that old man, that old moral nature is hostile to God. The Bible says the, the carnal mind cannot please God in any way. The carnal mind is happy with 98%. The carnal mind is happy with 99.9%. But Jesus is one of these 100% kind of guys. Remember, he, lost, he left the 99 to search for the one because 99% isn't complete. You can give God everything, but if there's one thing in your life that's outstanding, that you're refusing to yield, that you're refusing to give, that you just won't quite surrender. And, and for many people, this is different things. For me personally, for me personally, uh, and my kids are here, and, and I'm proud of them, and this is not an, any indictment against them. But as, as a parent, letting my kids go and, and let, not just letting them go out into, into the world, but releasing them into the hands of God. It's a huge thing for me. Huge thing. And they're both very capable, good young men. The issue isn't them, it's, it's me. And releasing and letting... For some people, it's a trauma or a hurt that they've gone through. And they just absolutely will... They'll give God everything else except for that trauma. Or they'll give God everything else but that behavior or that issue... God will help you deal with that issue. And sometimes that issue is dealt with in a, in a miraculous moment in time. Other times there's, there's a process of letting go and there's a, a process of letting bad things go and adopting new things. But if you're not in the process, if you're not in the lifestyle, 
if you're not in the mentality of, of Jesus not only paying for it all, but taking all of it. We're really happy to sing Jesus paid it all. But are we just as happy to sing Jesus take it all? Mm. I'll tell you a, a story, a true story. Pastor uh, went out and bought a new pulpit. One of those transparent ones. And on Saturday, he had it delivered to the church, and he put it in the church, and he put it in its place. And Sunday morning, he got to church early, like most pastors do, and unlocked the door, turned the thermos down on, went in the sanctuary, and his brand new pulpit was gone. And it could be heard, echoed all over the church building. Who moved my pulpit? Bit, 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 bit. And he could not find his new pulpit. And I'm just sharing that story to share. We have trouble letting certain things go. And, and in our lives, things become too big. Getting a new pulpit isn't bad. But how do you react when something changes? How do you respond when God closes a door that you just knew was going to be open? We often talk about God opening doors in our lives. How many people believe that God opens doors in our lives? We do believe that. But you, did you know that God also closes doors? Do you know that sometimes God says no? And sometimes God says yes. And sometimes God says yes but wait. You see, again, this all goes back to that Ark of the Covenant, stepping out before the people. And today, we are waiting, not for the Ark of the Covenant to step out, but we are waiting for the leadership of the Holy Spirit before we do things. Before we make that new big purchase that we think we've got to have or make this new decision or, or, or this parenting style or, or this or that, it's better to wait for God to step out first. I want to share this and then I'm going to let you go home. But consecration always comes before amazing things. Read verse 5 one more time. Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Verse 5 has the order right. Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things. That's the order of things. And so many times, we want to get God's best while holding back part of ourself. And if that doesn't define selfishness, I don't know what does. When we want the best from God, but we're holding part of ourselves back. And I'm going to leave you on a cliffhanger because we're not quite done with this. But the Ark of the Covenant is going to loom large in the book of Joshua. And the concept of consecration, well, it's, it's cover to cover. And it's something that we... Uh, uh, that we've all got to deal with. It's not just for ancient people in the year 1400, uh, but it's for us today in 2022. Amen? Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for the richness of the Word of God. And we've gone a little deep this morning. We've barely uh, uh, hit the tip of the iceberg of chapter 3. But Lord, I believe there are some principles here that you want us to catch on to and grasp on. And Lord, not just for an intellectual exercise, not just so that we've got more Bible information, but so that we might have transformation. And so Lord, we pray that <coughs> as we go through this book, you'd create a clean heart where there's a dirty heart. So you'll do a thorough examination, Lord, of our heart, soul, and mind, Lord, so that we can love you with all of those things. Thank you for these great people today. Bless them. 
and hold them dear to your heart today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to point out uh, uh, one thing that's not sermon related. Um, it was in your bulletin, and I failed to point it out. But we are looking to put together a team of, uh, of uh, nursery volunteers. And uh, our church is growing quite a bit. In fact, we have a, a new first-time visitor back there uh, by the wall. Uh, Julian Faith, would you guys like to introduce?